So uh, everyone who, who's joined already, hello. Uh, my name is Adam Sokol. I'm one half of the Professional Book Nerds podcast with my co-host, Jill Grunewald, who you're either seeing next to me or below, depending on how your Zoom is set up. Uh, we do a podcast called Professional Book Nerds. Every Monday and Thursday, we release an episode. Uh, every Monday, we do an author interview, and every Thursday, we do book recommendations. So uh, if you want to subscribe to us, you can do that anywhere you get your podcasts. Uh, we're really, really excited because today we are joined by Leila Saad, who is the New York Times bestselling author of Me and White Supremacy. Uh, if you've been a listener of our podcast for a while, you may, have, you may know or may remember that way back in January, uh, Leila joined me when we were all out to go places. Uh, we met each other at the American Library Association uh, Midwinter Conference which ended up being the last place I traveled to this year uh, back in wow. Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to have just a really great conversation about her new guided journal and mean white supremacy and a lot of really, really great things. I do want to point out, uh, you may also notice that we have um, American Sign Language uh, present here. So if that helps you, know, you to enjoy the experience, it's really excited. This is the first time I've ever uh, had an interpreter here with us. So uh, I am not going to do any more introduction. I will let Jill kick us off with our questions, but just want to say thank you for joining us. And uh, here we go. Yeah, thank you so much, Layla, for coming on. So I think um, to start, we'd love to have you talk a little bit about the new guided journal that you have recent, very recently published. I think it came out last week. Is that right? Yes, I have it here. Um, it came out last Tuesday. So a week exactly, a week exactly. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a continuation of the work. Uh, me and White Supremacy began as an Instagram challenge and each time has reiterated itself again and again um, to go deeper, to become more expansive and to help people who are going through the work to really really do the work, really face themselves on the page. Um, when we started in 2018, it was an Instagram challenge and people were facing themselves in the Instagram comments section. And there's only so much that you can write there. And um, while that process was really transformative and, also, and obviously is the reason why we're all here today having this conversation, there is something to be said about um, how deep one can go when they are aware that there are so many other strangers looking at what they are writing. So taking it onwards from an Instagram, a public Instagram challenge to a, a more private process, first through the workbook, which actually is almost exactly two years old. So I released it on my birthday, which is next week, um, on the 24th of November, two years ago. And really thought that would be it, honestly. Thought the Instagram challenge was huge. You know, I'm gonna put out this workbook, have help people have more access to it. And then that's as far as it's going to go. Um, I think within three days of publishing that workbook, I realized this is not as far as it's going to go because within three days, 11,000 people had downloaded it. And it just spread like complete wildfire and people who'd never heard of the Instagram challenge were downloading it and accessing it and working their way through it. And I was seeing it posted by teachers who were working through it um, to help them show up as better teachers to kids of color. I was seeing people use it in nonprofits and in companies and just in places and spaces I couldn't have predicted. And so the next iteration after the workbook was obviously the, the hardcover book that was published earlier this year. Um, and Adam and I, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, sat down in Philadelphia to have that conversation about that book. And now with the guided journal. It's really about helping people to understand, look, this isn't a book that you read. Mm -hmm. This is a book that you do. You really have to involve yourself in this process beyond reading theoretical, intellectual ideas and having it maybe pierce a certain part of your consciousness, but not really going deep into that me part, right? That me and white supremacy is the important part of this whole process. And I really felt like having your own journal, something that 
you see a sacred, something that you see as yours. It's the place where you um, <laughs> I have this feeling of like vomiting up, right? <laughs> all of this, all of this stuff that's inside unconscious um, racist thoughts and beliefs and things that you've done in the past, memories and questions, all of those things in a space that is private, in a space that is yours, something that you can refer back to again and again, something that you can see your progress with as well, right? Because this is also isn't a, pro a process that you do once. It is really lifetime work and seeing as I grow in my consciousness and as I as I uncover those first few layers and as I um, become less fragile about talking about white supremacy and my relationship with it, what more have I learned about myself? And I'm always so heartened when I see comments by readers who say, this is my third round going through it. This is my fourth round going through it. And they're tracking to see how much they have changed. So I'm really excited to, to have this journal out in the world because I think it's so important, especially right now, for people to go even deeper um, than they were before. You were, you were talking about the, the different iterations of the book, you know, coming out in different versions. First off, for people um, who are Spanish language speaking, we just were told uh, the Spanish language version yes, came out today. I've got that here as well. <laughs> and uh, it's very exciting because when this workbook, when the workbook came out two years ago, I got so many emails from people around the world saying, would you like me to translate your workbook for you? <laughs> um, and so I was like, this needs to be done, but it needs to be done right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's really exciting having the first translated edition out. Uh, when you were referencing the guided journal, I was, I was smiling because I was thinking about, so I, I read it obviously before you and I spoke and then I read it again since. And I also have listened to the audiobook, which which you did. And I was smiling because I, I think the guided journal would do really, really well with the audiobook because there's actually there's even a part in it, it might be somewhere along the middle where you kind of call people out, which is a it's fantastic. You say you're like, um, by the way, if you're listening to this audiobook and you're just listening to it, that's not enough. Like you said, this is an actionable book actionable book, and and I do think for people yeah. who are audiobook fans, I think the guided journal would do really well for that type of a, of a parent. I was smiling because I was just remembering that, that part of the audiobook. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I think there's something to be said about hearing something and then letting the ideas percolate and then writing down, you know, what comes up for you. Yeah. Oh, Joe, go ahead. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so we actually um, have a question from an audience member which was, you know, speaking of mean white supremacy, and you touched on this a little bit, but what originally inspired you to write the book? So, um, you know, the book was a, an outpouring of this Instagram challenge. And I feel like the, I think, I feel like the, the bigger question is what inspired me to do the Instagram challenge? Because mm -hmm. that's where, that's where it started. And then the momentum built after that, once I saw the process, once I saw how people were engaging with it. Um, there's two answers to the question about how this work started. You know, there's the, there's the sort of the longer question around the longer context around my own, um, journey as I had been talking about white supremacy for almost a year prior to the, to starting the challenge. And, uh, I started talking about white supremacy uh, when I when I published an article called I Need to Talk to Spiritual White Women About White Supremacy. It was right after the Charlottesville um, uh, pr protests and marches and, and unite, unite the Right rally. And I wrote this article. It went very, very viral. And it was the first time I'd ever written about race, racism, white supremacy. But it went viral. And so I was suddenly thrust into this public conversation um, about this topic. And then Every day I was having conversations online with white people about white supremacy. And it was a really exhausting time of my life. Um, and I say that even having gone through the Instagram challenge, which was one of the most exhausting times of my life, because holding that amount of space for thousands of people over the, over the course of a month was a lot. But when I first started talking about white supremacy, I wasn't yet prepared. I had never done it. Um, I, even, uh, even though I wrote about white fragility in the article, even I didn't realize the extent to which it was present within so-called liberal, progressive, spiritual white people. 
And it was a lot for me to hold and I didn't really know how to hold my boundaries. And I couldn't understand why um, people who were self-proclaimed not racist were so, so defensive and so angry and could be so racist, you know? And so um, uh, over, over the course of a year though, I definitely noticed a shift that those same people when I had talked to them at that time, you know, months later were now coming back and so going, you know what, she's right. You know what, I'm starting to understand what white supremacy is. I'm starting to understand that yes, while I may not have lived a super privileged life economically or from a class perspective, I do hold white privilege and this is what it means. And so I was noticing people having more nuance in how they talked about white supremacy. And so that was the kind of longer context. The shorter context was one night I was trying to fall asleep and I was wondering about this very same question. What has changed over the course of this year that has made it so that these same conversations I was having a year ago are not as laborious for me as they were back then. Like what's the shift? What, what have they learned about themselves and white supremacy that makes this conversation easier? And so I was, uh, I grabbed my phone. I start writing a post asking this question. What have you learned about you and white supremacy? Um, and before I go to put it out, I start asking myself, so what is white supremacy? Because that's a really loaded question and maybe people don't understand what I mean by it. And so I start listing these different aspects of white supremacy and these different aspects became the topics in the book, the 28 days of exploration, you know, white privilege, tokenism, cultural appropriation, and so on. And so that's, that's where it started. Like that very same night, instead of posting a single Instagram post saying, what have you learned? I said, tomorrow, we're going to take a 28 day journey. <laughs> and we're going to look at what have you learned about you and, and white supremacy. And I really feel that there was a divine wisdom behind it as well, because I think the shift that made this work what it is and makes it so that it's not as hard for me as it could be is that I put the onus on people with white privilege to do the work instead of feeling like I had to do the work. You know, and, and so if you've heard me in any interview, you'll hear me again and again say, this is not a book that you read. This is a book that you do. You have to really engage with this process. Like the responsibility really is on people with white privilege to do the work. And I have found from the feedback that I have received that that has been really transformative for the people who are engaging with it sincerely. So that's, that's how it started. Throughout the creation of the initial challenge, and then of course, by extension, you know, the, the workbook and, and the book, were there chapters or challenges that you personally might have struggled with devising for people to be able to take actionable items away from? I think that the, the struggle wasn't so much that um, it was hard for me to devise it so that people would understand it. The struggle was that it was hard for me to write about for me. Um, and those were the, the three days on anti-blackness. So anti-blackness and black women, anti-blackness and black men, anti-blackness and black children, and also um, racist stereotypes as well, which was really looking at racist stereotypes of all people of color um, and, and how that shows up in different ways. Those three, four days were the hardest for me to write personally mm -hmm. because they require having to reflect on how I, how I am treated in the world, how I have been treated, um, how I was treated as a young girl, how my children may be treated, how my husband, my brothers, my father um, may be treated. And it, it's really personal. Like this work is so, so personal. And there is a large extent to which I think as a, as a survival and sanity tactic, I kind of have to detach so that I can present the work without pouring all my pain and trauma and anger and grief into it. But on those days in particular, I, I did find it harder to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge really, and I, and I see this this year, especially when we've seen the, the um, Black Lives Matter protests and the changes and the things that have come out of that is mm -hmm. how do we talk about our pain as Black people and the things that we go through without 
prostituting ourselves without saying, see how much I hurt, see how I'm treated in the world, um, see how difficult it is for me to be this and be and, and have that fear of being pigeonholed into just trauma, just pain, just grief. Um, and so that's that's the that's the hard part mm -hmm. for me. Um, I was wondering if we could take a few minutes to talk about a version of this for younger members of society as well, which is, of course, so important um, right now. How, you know, we'll just sort of, you know, start there, you know, a version of this for younger audiences and the importance of that. Yeah, so that's something I'm currently working on. Um, and I, I'll be honest, um, it's a project that is so much bigger than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> it's so much bigger. And it's, it's funny because it's happening this year, right? So I met Adam uh, on my US tour, and then I came back home here, and then I went to the UK for my UK tour. And then the plan was come home, write the book. Within less than a week of me being back home from my tour, we were in on lock in lockdown. You know, the kids were home from school. I was suddenly homeschooling for the first time ever, and I was adjusting from being on tour for a month. I w and I'm introverted, right? And it's a lot of energy to spend. So I was like, I can't do this right now. <laughs> but when I did, when I when we so sort of started finding some level of equilibrium and you know we started using the phrase the new normal this is the new normal and we started adjusting to it it was like okay it's time to write the young readers edition right it's just the adult version but for younger kids and I start working on it and I'm like oh no this isn't this isn't what I thought it would be um there were so many considerations I had to think about you know initially it was just write a young readers edition for kids who have white privilege to do the work. Mm. And as soon as I started working on it, I thought, no, that's not the right thing to do here because what will end up happening is kids with white privilege will become very nuanced and very skilled at having a conversation about white supremacy mm -hmm. and white privilege and kids of color will not. Mm -hmm. And that does harm in a whole other way. Right. Right. So, to, okay, let me just pull back out here. What are you trying to achieve? What is it that you're trying to do? And what I'm trying to do is give young people the language, the skills, the understanding, the context, right? And the, um, the abilities and the empathy and compassion to be able to have conversations about white supremacy and racism with a sense of resilience, with clarity, mm -hmm. with the ability to think critically, and with a desire to want to come together and work towards change together. And so how do you write a book like that when you still have to speak to the fact that some kids have white privilege and some don't, and some kids uh, are, are mixed or biracial and so are having other experiences as well. How do we have that conversation? And so that's why this project, which I feel like I'm finding my feet with it now, <laughs> but it, it took a moment because I really had to think of what's the, what's going to be the long-term legacy of this? What's going, mm -hmm. where is it going to be used? How is it going to be used? If it's only two white kids and it's presented and it's used in a school, where do the kids of color go while the white kids are reading this book, right? Okay, so if they're all gonna be in the room, how do I best equip them to be having the conversation together? Um, and so I, I feel, I, I felt um, frustrated at <laughs> the beginning while, while trying to figure all of these, these things out. But right now I feel really privileged to get to write this book mm -hmm. because I think if I do it right, and if I get it right, it could really be a tool for change. What's so interesting about this is um, actually not long after you and I first spoke, uh, I sat down with Jason Reynolds and Dr. Kendi, Dr. Eva Max Kendi. Uh, Dr. Kendi wrote Stamped from the beginning, and then Jason, of course, you know, created the version Stamped, the remix. And I'm laughing because Dr. Kendi basically, he said like the opposite of what, what you said in the sense of he was like, I want to make a a young, I wanted to make a young reader's version of Stamp from the beginning. He's like, but I didn't know how to speak to young kids. So I found the, the, a great person right. who can do that with Jason. <laughs> but um, I imagine for you writing a version of this 
that is different from the original? Does it have anything to do with the fact that people who will read Me and White Supremacy as adults, they can take deliberate action and they know it's on them. Whereas a child, you know, a younger reader, maybe a lot of the things that they're experiencing, A, they're very likely learned behaviors, but also going on their own journey as a 15, 16, 17 year old while still under, you know, a house where maybe their parents aren't as yeah. open. Like, are there aspects that you have to think about where it's like, not only how to speak with each other in a classroom, but also how to converse with their parents about these things as well. Definitely, definitely. And I, and I, I feel that um, it will be very important to have a sort of adult's guide to go with it. I mean, I hope any adult, any child who reads the Young Readers Edition has adults around them who have gone through the adult version. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be able to, to um, be someone that they can talk to and be someone that they can, that can hold space for them. But yeah, I mean, the Young Readers Edition that I'm writing is for ages 10 to 14 years old. Yeah. Um, it's really young. And I, you know, I have a, uh, I have an 11 year old and I have a six year old and I remember at the beginning with this project, because I've also never written for children, I had the same thoughts of, of, uh, of Ibram, of I, I don't know how to write to kids. I don't, and, my, and you know my writing style, it's very direct. I'm not here to coddle. I'm not here to right. you know, tell you it's all going to be okay, right? Like this, this is the facts. This is what's going on. This is what you need to look at. Okay, you can't talk to children in that way. Mm -hmm. So this has to be different. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that... I had to come to the realization that kids are a lot more aware of things than we think they are. And they're also a lot more resilient than we think they are. And they are not yet so formed in their identity that these ideas will shatter who they think they are in the way that it does with adults. And so it's really about helping them in the same way that, you know, when you're studying in school, ed any other subject, you learn something and then you get to the next year and you learn, oh, actually last year you learned the simple version of it. This is actually the more complex version of it. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I'm approaching this and that's that's how I'm seeing it. But yeah, it, it's it's absolutely a consideration that I, that I bear in mind of a child who is reading this alone. Again, a child of any race. I want them to feel like they are, they are the ones I'm speaking to. I didn't want it to feel like I was only speaking to white kids and black mm -hmm. kids get to read it or kids of color get to read it. No, every child should feel like I'm speaking to them. And as I'm going through the process of guiding them through this, I, I want them to feel safe. You know, I want them to feel like, yes, this is hard. Yes, this is upsetting. And we, and we need to talk about the realities of that, but it's, it's okay, you know, and, and we can do this. And there are adults or um, bigger kids and adults who are also working to create change. And although I don't talk about the concept of being a good ancestor in the book, because I, I kind of think it's beyond 10 to 14 year olds, mm -hmm. kind of, that's not where they're at. Um, but that's the, that's what I'm holding for myself is like, how can I help them? How can I prepare them to grow up into kids who will really be focused on how can I become a good ancestor? Did you do any research when you were, you know, adapting for children? Was there any sort of process about that? Yeah. So one of the main differences between the adult version and the kids version is that I felt it was really important to include a historical context of the beginnings of white supremacy and um, European colonialism and the history of racist ideas because without understanding where all of this comes from it just seems like well why does the world exist like this it just it just doesn't seem right and it doesn't seem fair why are the adults doing this um, and, and I felt it was very important to link history to the modern day so that they could see things which may not look like, um, they may not look that racist or may not look like they're that bad, actually have a long history and it's added pain, right? So I felt that that was really important. And I, I actually feel like this was would have been important for the adult version because there's a lot of adults who don't have that context as well. I mean, one of the things that I write about in the, in the kids version is the difference between race, ethnicity, and nationality. 
you know, cause I was like, oh, they're, you know, my kid, my, <laughs> my six-year-old asked me um, a couple of months ago, about a month ago, he said, how do we, how do we know that we are black? And I thought, you know what? Yeah, because he doesn't have in his mind yet a concept of races. So he just sees different colors and they go to a fairly international school. So he doesn't know, you know, this is that. or the, And he has a, a teaching assistant who is Indian. And he said to me last week, oh, my teacher is black. And I said, no, she's not. She's the same shade as him. <laughs> and so that's how he made the connection. Uh -huh. She's the same color as him. So he made that connection. So I thought, oh, I need to explain the difference between race, ethnicity, and nationality. But I also think adults need to understand that as yeah. well. Um, but yeah, that, that adding that context, adding that um, those ideas, I felt was very, very important um, to get to give kids an understanding and link them back to it. So when we're talking about something like cultural appropriation, you know, it's not just you can wear this or you can't wear that. You can do this or you can't do that because it's offensive. Why is it offensive? Mm -hmm. Let's look back at the history and see how these um, cultures, which were so sacred, you know, colonizers came and said, you can't have this, you can't speak that language, you can't practice that religion, you can't wear those clothes, are now taking those same things and using them to profit off of them and to say that they're cool, but holding them back from those same races. So I felt it was important to have that context and that background. Has anything surprised you throughout your research and writing process like that maybe you personally didn't know or you weren't expecting to experience other than your initial what you told us about it being just substantially uh, different than the initial writing? I think doing more in-depth reading about the history of colonialism. You know, I don't come from an academic background, mm -hmm. so I didn't, I don't have the depth of understanding as somebody who writes books in that context or has studied that. Um, so, so digging into that and really understanding um, how, just how much European colonialism shaped our world was, um, was as, a, as somebody who loves history, it was fascinating. As somebody who is a, a, a person who is directly affected by it was absolutely traumatizing. And um, I definitely went through a process in this year of doing that research, starting to write those sections of the book and then having to put it away because it was so painful for me. I was so upset and angry. Um, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you one, one example of something that, was, that really impacted me was learning about just how the continent of Africa was carved up by various European forces that people, that countries that didn't exist suddenly existed because Europeans said, we want this slice, we want that slice, we want this part, we want that part, and split tribes, people apart from them, from each other, mm -hmm. right? And privilege some over others, either because they were lighter skinned or they felt that they were more civilized or they were more co cooperative with European forces and how the repercussions of that still exist today, even though European colonizers now are not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so reading about things like that, I it really upset me. Um, and then I had to figure out like, well, if I'm, I'm pissed off, like I'm really angry and I don't want to write this book pissed off and angry. Like, I don't, that's not my aim is to make kids <laughs> pissed off and angry now right. over something that they cannot change. Right. So I had to kind of put, put the project down and step away and go deal with my feelings. And that took some time as well. Like I had to allow myself to grieve. And I remember I would just burst into tears or I would just roll up in a ball and just, you know, and, and I remember saying to one of my friends, it takes a lot of um, pain to make something, to make something healing. Mm. Like it, once it's done and the book is there and it's pretty and it's got this gorgeous cover and the, and the writing flows and it's this um, process that makes sense. It makes sense as you're reading it, but the process of actually doing the work behind the scenes, which, no, which people don't really see, 
is very painful and it takes processing a lot of pain to create something that is very healing. I know you have you know, said that you believe books can be used as a learning tool for complex layered topics. And you've sort of you know, gone into that a little bit. Can you expand on that? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, one of the things that I did this year in preparation for writing the book was read um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paolo Freire. And it had been a book that was on my list for a really long time, but I, I knew it was like a really dense. <laughs> it was like, I feel like I need to be, there has to be a purpose for me to read it. Like I need to be prepared from it. And, you know, one of the major things that I took away from it um, that really stuck with me and, and will stick with me for a very long time is this idea of critical consciousness, or uh, he called it conscientization, which I'm butchering his meaning behind it, but this is what I understood, which is that our, um, any action that we take has to be informed by the consciousness that we have around it, which comes from education and learning. And any education and learning that we have should, should be informed by the action that we take, like both go hand in hand together, which is why I'm, in hindsight, I think, which is why I'm uh, so adamant about don't just read the book, do the book. Um, when, when it comes to it, this topic of white supremacy, white people, people who have white privilege, it, it is the function of white supremacy that white people not know that it exists, that they not know that they have privilege, that they not know the history of whiteness and white supremacy and colonialism, or that they know that it exists, but don't keep it close to them as something that is, is still having an impact in the world today. And so books, books like Ibram's, like you said, books like mine and so many others, which have been written for centuries, really, truly, mm -hmm. um, are doing that work to say, this is what is happening. This is what is actually happening. This is what is actually going on. These are what our actual experiences are. I know that we exist in a world where if you have white privilege, you don't have to be aware of these things, but not being aware of them doesn't mean they don't exist. And, you know, I, I'm a book lover as you <laughs> as you both are and uh and and one and I remember being a kid and I would always read widely I always wanted to know everything about everything um the th the thing that I'm asking people who have white privilege to do is curate your learning because there are so many books out there that speak about this topic from so many different perspectives right fiction and nonfiction and poetry, essay collections, and so many different things um, that give you an understanding of a world and an experience that privilege has denied you from seeing and experiencing. And I think through that, through the power of words, through the power of knowledge, that can be an opening to seeing, seeing the whole world as opposed to seeing it through the, the eyes of uh, privilege. To you know, kind of expand upon that. Uh, throughout 2020, it, it, one thing that I have been pleasantly surprised with, which is a rare thing to say in 2020, um, mm -hmm. one of the things I've been pleasantly surprised to see is if you look at the nonfiction New York Times bestsellers list throughout most of the year, you know, you'll see your book and you'll see Stamped and Stamped from the beginning, both of them, and you'll see, you know, so you want to talk about race and, you know, Morgan Jerkins' new book, Wandering in a Strange Land, and all of these wonderful books and, you know, even older books like um, For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide. Like there's all of these. And Octavia Butler's book, yeah. Yeah. Audrey Lords, right. There's all of these wonderful and important nonfiction books. Um, the New Jim Crow is one that Joe and I have talked about a lot this year. Uh, and they're incredibly important. And I, I'm so excited that people are reading these books and taking time to learn, you know, the history of white supremacy and, you know, all of the things that go into how they can you know, be a better member of society and a better ancestor. Uh, and you touched on this a little bit, but do you think that fictional stories can be as powerful as nonfiction? And then you know, if so, like maybe what are some ones that you've taken inspiration from personally? Mm, yeah. I mean, I think, I, th I think that as human beings, we are, you know, meaning making creatures and we love stories and there's something about, 
stories that can take us beyond that intellectual understanding away from that detachment of, oh, okay, so this is what happened. This is the historical um, factual, you know, things of what happened to mm -hmm let me connect to the story of one individual and their striving. So one of the books that this year was really powerful for me and I know for so many people was The Water Dancer by ta Coates. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love his um, nonfiction writing. I remember, I remember reading Between the World and Me, um, which I read many years after it was published, um, cracking it open, reading the first page for the first time ever and just thinking, this is like bathing in like his words are like bathing in a waterfall of just luxury like you just want to stay in it right mm -hmm. like you don't want the words to end you don't want the pages to end and I remember reading it every now and then going to my husband this is so good like I need you to understand how good this is and my husband is the complete opposite to me is not a reader at all uh yeah I know oh no <laughs> I think honestly, I think it's what makes us work. I think having <laughs> us be so we are very, very different, I think is what makes us work. Um, but you know, I really remember reading his his nonfiction and thinking he's a really poetic writer. And so when I knew the water dancer was coming out, I was like, this is gonna be amazing. I just know it. I just yeah. know it's gonna be amazing. Um, and it was. And reading the stories um, and, and the amount of research that he talked about that he did for writing those stories and the process that I know he must have gone through, which he may also not have talked about, made that book so, so powerful. And though there is a superstitious element to the book as well, I think that hearing those stories in that way and letting them sit within you and really taking it in, like, th like this happened to real people. This isn't, this isn't a from a long time ago in another lifetime, right? This was yeah. real people not that many generations ago and it still has an impact today. So yeah, I think nonfiction, I think fiction is very, very important. And I think the two go hand in hand and I would add poetry to that as well because mm -hmm. I, I find poetry very powerful. I think it, um, you know, there's um, the essay by Audre Lorde, poetry is not a luxury. Right. It, it really isn't. I really encourage people to read that essay and I return to it whenever I'm whenever I feel like I've lost a sense of enchantment and a sense of um, spiritual grounding. I return to that essay often. And she talks about, you know, poetry is the, is the light through which we see ourselves like it, through, in between the words. It's saying the things that we're experiencing. The energy is there inside. And so, yeah, I think having poetry, having fiction and having nonfiction helps us to build a more multi-layered pictural, you know, understanding of, of these things. One of the challenges, um, you know, in terms of getting those books out there is that the publishing industry, there are obstacles for black and brown writers that exist. Um, do you mind touching on that a little bit? Like what challenges you see? And then are there ways that readers and librarians and others can maybe help those authors? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's very important to acknowledge and understand that structural racism and institu institutional racism holds black and brown people back or um, limits them from receiving opportunities in all industries. And in the publishing world in particular, um, it, it's something that we, it's something that you may not realize until you really begin to look at who's on the best-selling lists and who's seen as a credible expert. And, um, you know, when you, when you walk through the, the, the bookshop, you know, and you're looking at the fiction titles, you know, who is the majority of the writers here? On these on these shelves, uh, the the other day I was um, 
trying to find a new audiobook for myself because I started going walking some mornings and I wanted to listen to something uplifting and affirming and I haven't listened to like a personal development book for a really long time like I'm, I've been heavy in Malcolm X's memoir and I just started Barack Obama's memoir right so it's it's all stuff related to my work and I wanted something that was just just personal development just self-help so I did a google search okay uh top uh uh, self-help books, top personal development books, and nearly every single book was by a white author. And the thing that frustrates me about this is that oftentimes, um, oftentimes many of the modalities that are suggested to take care of ourselves, so self-care modalities, spiritual modalities, um, even like, like self-therapeutic modalities, um, many of them have a basis in black and brown cultures, right? So meditation, yoga, crystals, right? Um, mantras, like they have this basis from black and brown cultures. And so I know that we do self-care work. I know that we do personal growth and personal development. Why are we not on these lists, right? And so there's various things, there's various barriers that prevent prevent people from getting on those lists, whether it's the inability to find agents who'll work with you, the inability um, or the unwillingness of publishing houses to, to work with those authors unless they are writing about books like, such as mine, unless they are writing around what it means to be Black or race or things of that nature. Um, and then uh, even then, like the the uh, bias towards maybe not pre-ordering books of black and brown authors, right? And one of the things I talk about in, in Me and White Supremacy is white centering. And I say one of the signs of white, of white centering is if the authors that you read are primarily white. Mm. So if you as a reader are primarily favoring, whether you know it or not, books that are written by white authors, you are also contributing to the demand that there isn't a demand for books by black and brown authors in other fields outside of race. And so everyone has their role to play, right? Um, it's where are the books positioned? Are they requested? Are they asked for? And are we willing, you know, to, to zooming out, are we willing to let black and brown people have an existence and have creative expression outside of their experiences related to racism? It's so interesting you say that because even thinking about <clears throat> uh, fictional stories uh, earlier this year, <clears throat> excuse me, I sat down with uh, Jordan Fueco who wrote a book called Ray Bear. She's a young adult. Uh, she's, a, she's a black author who is a young adult fantasy writer. And she kind of commented a little bit about what you're talking about here, but she also said that it's interesting when, when you are an author of color and you do have your book released, they initially wanted to classify it as African fantasy. And she said, she was like, by extension, they wanted to point, like now that I am, she said something along the lines of like, now that I am one of the chosen ones, they wanted it to be pointed out that I am an African fantasy writer. And she was like, I wrote a fantasy book that yes, is based in African folklore and is, is based in an area that in the fantasy world she created would be technically like an African nation. And she's like, but I wrote a fantasy book. That's how it should be classified. Right. And so, and I, I think it's interesting when, yeah. by extension, when they do, you know, when publishing does open the door to a black and brown author and say, okay, write your story. They so often want to say, this better be about racism or this is a African science fiction, for example. It's, it, they always, the, you know, publishing tends to want to still keep them apart even when it is a published book. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and I know that um, 2020 has, um, has, has challenged many industries to really look at themselves and really look at who's in the decision-making roles. You know, what culture, background, race do they come from? And are the people who can make executive decisions, like real decisions, you know, are there people of color in, the, in those spaces? Mm -hmm. And quite often they are not. Um, and the publishing industry is one of those spaces that is extremely white dominated. And, um, and so it's on, 
it's it's on it's like it's it's on the industry to change from within but i think it's also on readers to demand that we this is what we want we want something different we don't just want this um but i think that comes with and what i was speaking about uh just a minute ago i think this comes back to this question of are people with white privilege willing to do the work so that they can allow black and brown people to have a sense of dignity and humanity outside of the story of racism? And can we just be, you know, like um, Octavia Butler here behind me, can we just be science fiction writers who are also black and maybe all our protagonists are black, right? But this isn't a black story, it's just a story. Um, so I, I think that there's there's much work to be done around that. I think it's also really important not to slip into white saviorism or tokenism um, or trying to prove that we're one of the good ones because look at how look at all the black authors that we have. Um, are you treating those black authors well? Are you treating them the same? Are you paying them the same as your white authors? Um, are they having the same? All of those things are really, really important, but I think it it's true and relevant outside of publishing too. You touched a little bit about why, you know, it's not a book that you, Mean White Supremacy is not a book that you read, it's a book that you do. And you have this guided journal, which goes along with that. Can you talk a little bit more on why it is so essential for people to understand that simply reading Mean White Supremacy isn't enough? Yeah, I think that the simplest way that I can express it is that we're talking about real, the real, um, the real impact that a system of violence is having on real people who are living today, as opposed to something that happened a long time ago, but doesn't exist right now. And so when you treat this work, and when I say this work, I don't, I don't mean my book, I mean anti-racism. When you treat it as something that is interesting or fascinating or really stimulating or made you have a really good think, you haven't connected the, the dots to, no, I'm a person who has privilege. Me not examining my privilege and not doing this work results in real harm and violence happening to real people who are alive today. And, and so this withholding, like this unwillingness to allow your heart, I say in the book, this, this work is heartbreaking and heart expanding. If you don't allow your heart to break and not to break at what black and brown and indigenous people go through, but to break at the ways in which you personally are complicit in white supremacy, then we can't get to a state where you realize, okay, I didn't know that before, but now I know, and now I choose not to consciously be complicit. Now I choose to purposely be anti-racist. Um, and so that not reading it is in itself, it's, it comes from a place of privilege, but it's also, I, fi I find it an act of violence. I know that's really strong language to use, but I find it violent to know that people are killed by white supremacy, by racism, and yet your response is still, I'm going to read this book to find out more and see if there's anything that I can do to help, knowing full well, right, that this, this actually requires full engagement. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, I, I also get it. I get why people don't want to, like, don't want to <laughs> dive in because we don't like change. We don't like transformation. We don't like being outside of our comfort zone. We don't like feeling like we're doing something wrong, especially when we don't know what it is that we've done wrong. And we don't want to have to look back and think, oh, no, like that's not what I had intended or that's not what I wanted it to be. And I don't feel like there's anything that I can do about it. But it is what it is. We have the world that we have. And so allowing yourself to face those feelings which are absolutely valid they are absolutely valid feelings but they won't destroy your life in the way that racism destroys lives and so part of being a person who has white privilege part of like the journey of anti-racism is sitting with yourself and really asking am i am i willing to come out of my comfort zone, to inconvenience myself, 
to get it wrong, to be hurt, to be maybe called out, right? Um, because it's the right thing to do to engage in this work because it will in some way, first, lessen harm and second, potential, potentially save lives. At the beginning of our conversation, you were talking you know, a lot about being a good ancestor and uh, this is something that you, know, you talk on a lot. You have a, a podcast called the Good, Answer, uh, good Ancestor Podcast and it's it's really inspiring, and you have um, you, know, you offer up a lot of important conversations with experts and, and thought leaders. And as a listener, I've been listening you know kind of all year, and I take a lot out of each episode. But as the host, you know, what do you mm -hmm. find your biggest takeaway is? So, um, in Good Ancestor Podcast, I make a real intentional. Uh, I made a real intentional decision to primarily predominantly interview black and brown people, especially black women, because I feel like we're often under platformed, not given the space to shine our light and show our magic and our expertise and share our journeys. One of the th biggest things I think that I am always struck by is just how much good work people are doing in the world. And they're doing it despite um, uh, restrictions or despite being despite having identities which are often marginalized, whether through gender, race, orientation, uh, sexual orientation, and so on and so forth. Um, that even despite all of that, there's such resiliency and there's such creativity and there's such a passion to want to keep showing up in a world that often feels, especially this year, dystopian, right? This, this world, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say up until maybe just a couple of weeks ago, this world felt very dystopian. And, and even now um, still very much does, does, does feel like that. Yet there are so many people who continue to hold light and to continue to say, I'm going to keep showing up. And, um, and it's like I walk away from each episode feeling inspired. And it's this great gift that I get to receive from, from the guests and get to learn from them and get to share with other people as well. And I, 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 you know, I know that my intention with the podcast is to offer a space for hope and for inspiration, to tell the truth about things that are going on. You know, we do talk, talk about systemic oppression and racism and, and all of that, but we also offer a space for hope and for a better world and that each one of us can individually do something about this. Um, and so that, that's what always strikes me that it doesn't have to be the people up there with power, that there are people on the ground doing really incredible work right now and that each one of us can do that too. Um, well, it's a, it's a wonderful podcast and you sort of answered our last question a little bit, which was <laughs> <laughs> asking what inspired you to start the podcast. Is, I mean, do you have any more about that? I, so I mentioned I'm an introvert and um, I just really like having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who are doing interesting things. And I think it started just for me, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just like, I want to, I want to have this conversation. I want to talk to this, this person or that person, but I also want to, I want other people to know about them. I want other people to know what they're doing. Um, yeah. So my in intention is definitely like be selfish and do this thing that fills, that fills me up <laughs> and offers a place of light when so much of the work that I do is so heavy. And at the same time, remind people these are just ordinary people, just like me, just like you. These are ordinary people who have made decisions in their lives to do things that they're passionate about because it feels like the right thing for them to do and that they are living ancestors right now making a difference in the world and we are all living ancestors. And so um, if there's anything that I want to, you know, I often think about what is, what is it that you're leaving behind? Like what is the body of work, right? Because Instagram, social media, that's not a body of work. That's things that we scroll by and we might write really deep and interesting things on there, but it, it goes, right? It's really transient, but things that last, books, um, courses, um, 
podcast episodes and conversations. I want this to be a treasure trove that people can look back on and say, wow, that conversation was back in <laughs> 2000, whatever. And it's, it, it's made me feel this about myself and it's made me realize I can do this. And it's made me realize that my life isn't actually about this path, it's actually about this other path. Um, that, that's what I want for it to be. Well, I mean, your body of work continues to grow and grow despite being in the craziness that we're in right now and homeschooling mm-hmm. and everything else. You're you know, working on, like you mentioned, the, the Young Reader Virgin. Um, for everyone who joined us, obviously, thank you so much for doing so. Me and White Supremacy, both the book and the audiobook and the Spanish version and now the guided journal are all available. Um, definitely get every version that you think will best kind of help you. Um, Layla, thank you so much for taking this time with us. I know it was extremely valuable for, for Jill and I, and hopefully just as valuable for everyone who joined us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I so enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Adam and Jill, and thank you to our ASL interpreters too. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, that's going to conclude our special event here with Layla. Thank you.